Hey, everybody. Before we jump into today's episode, I just want to point out a few ways in which you can work with us here at How to SaaS. Number one, if you're an investor and you're in the middle of a transaction and you want to figure out what is the marketing potential of the target investment that I'm looking at, you can engage with us in a due diligence engagement where within two weeks, we can give you a very clear picture of all the levers within the marketing function of that organization and how you can scale budget up and down and find efficiencies and make the overall marketing function far more mature. Number two, if you're a founder, a CEO, an operator, or even an, an investor, and you have a company where marketing is just under leveraged and you see it as a growth lever for your business to take it to the next level, you can engage with us in a three to four month engagement where we do a deep dive and look at all the possible areas where marketing can make a bigger impact on the organization and come back with a detailed set of recommendations across demand gen, paid media, ABM, uh, content marketing, product marketing, SEO, you name it and come back with a full set of recommendations, your entire new org design to support those recommendations and overall budget recommendations for the business. And number three, if you have a particular business where maybe your VP of marketing was recently transitioned out, maybe they left for another job, maybe you don't have a CMO but are thinking about hiring one, well, we can fill that gap within your organization with part-time CMO services. And we do this on a month to month retainer, which can last anywhere between three months to 12 months, depending on what your needs are. And we can help set the foundation for the company and help you hire your next CMO and help onboard them into the role so that when they come in, into the organization, they get a running start and they're able to make an impact on revenue right away. And you don't have to wait to find the right person to get going with all your marketing initiatives. So those are all the ways. If you want to learn more, go to www.hattasass.com and schedule a consult and we can go from there. And now on to the episode. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Private Equity Value Creation Podcast, where we interview leading investors, operators, bankers, and advisors to help you answer one question. How do we increase the enterprise value of our companies? My name is Shiv Narayanan, and each episode, I will dive deep with a guest to help you become a better value creator and capital allocator. So with that said, let's jump right in and let's get started with today's episode. My guest today is AJ Gandhi, and this episode was a phenomenal one. AJ is the Chief Growth Officer at Marlin Equity, and Marlin is one of the bigger private equity firms around. They invest in a ton of platform companies. They bolt on and add on additional acquisitions onto those platforms, and they have a pretty robust growth and value creation plan for those companies. And compared to other private equity firms, Marlin also has a larger operations group than most, and so that gives us some great insight into how they think about creating value once they get a company into their portfolio. So AJ and I dig into a ton of topics related to those portfolio companies and just companies in general in terms of how we can create enterprise value through through things like segmentation, through demand planning, through sales processes and playbooks, through pricing, through upsell, cross-sell, and ways in which product can support all those efforts. So there's a ton of great content in the episode, and it's really a uh, a, a deep dive into each of those areas. And there are many times when I felt like that's, this conversation could have been a few hours long so that we could, we could have gotten even deeper into each of those uh, subtopics. But for, for the audience and, and what you're going to be hearing, there's a lot of great content in there in terms of how you think about value creation for your specific company. So I hope you take all of that away. And then th we'll mention all the additional information in the show notes and link out to all of uh, Marlin's uh, resources there as well. So with that said, enjoy the episode. All right, AJ, welcome to the show. How's it going? Hey, I'm good, Chef. Happy Friday to you. Yeah, likewise. And it's great to have you on and super excited for the audience to learn about all the things that you're up to at Mar Marlin Equity. So why don't we start with your role at Marlin and specifically about the fund and what you guys are focused on? Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you about the fund first and I'll, I'll describe my role. So uh, we're a mid-sized private equity firm. Uh, we are investors in principally B2B SaaS companies. Uh, originally some on-prem that we brought over to SaaS, but now it's pretty much SaaS. Um, I, I think you could describe us originally as doing much more sort of corporate carve-outs and turnarounds, and we still very much do that, but uh, we're also very much investing in growth companies. And, you know, fundamentally what we're seeking to do is take, uh, a, you know, a, a software business that we think uh, is in a good market, and uh, we feel like that there's an opportunity to take them to the next level. 
uh, by enhancing the growth strategy, M and A, you know, a little bit tighter operational management. And we've done that with, I think we've made, you know, 150, 200 acquisitions over our lifespan, uh, which is, uh, I believe about 18 years. And, uh, currently we have 50 platform companies, uh, in the portfolio, um, about two thirds in North America, about one third in Europe and, uh, Company sizes, you know, I'd say most of them are in the, uh, the majority are in the 20 to 100 million range, uh, ARR, uh, probably about 20 plus percent of our companies are, you know, uh, 100 to 500 million ARR. Um, so we've, we've got some good size, uh, good size ones, uh, but you know, fundamentally we're mid, mid size software investors. Got it. And when you uh, refer to platform companies, are you specifically saying like the main investment in a, in a, in a particular space uh, and does size matter there? Because when you look at the 20% of those companies that are hundred million plus, like I'm, I'm assuming their makeup looks a lot different than the other companies that are in that 20 to hundred million dollar uh, range. No, I think it, ju it just, uh, so when we say platform company, we mean it's uh, an underlying core company. And uh, you, you know, we make a, we do a lot of uh, add on investments uh, just to enhance the business. So uh, that's just an opportunity uh, but to, that, that's just really a distinction between, um, you know, what is an add-on versus what is a foundational company from which we're going to build. Uh, maybe an example here uh, would be helpful. Um, you know, we started with a um, an ERP com or a company that did uh, scheduling for workers in the restaurant industry. Um, you know, we recognize, hey, well, that's a key part of uh, operating a restaurant, but there are many other aspects to it. Uh, there's hiring, there's inventory management, there's payments. Uh, payroll, et cetera. So we use that foundational investment in a company called and expanded it to, um, uh, you know, with a bunch of other acquisitions to create much more of a foundational or comprehensive uh, platform to uh, help, uh, you know, medium and large size restaurant chains uh, run their business more efficiently. Um, and uh, so that that's an example of, um, we call that one company, even though it's a bunch of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. A bunch of, uh acquisitions merged into that platform. So that's great. And, and when you look at the value creation philosophy of Marlin overall, is it heavier on the M&A and inorganic side or is organic just as much of a priority when you look at these platform investments? Yeah, just as much of a priority. I, I think fundamentally, uh, you know, like, uh, to be a software investor these days, you have to, um, uh, you, you know, you're paying a reasonable valuation to, to get into the business. So, um, you know, we feel like we have to apply as many different levers of value creation um, as possible. So, uh, you know, fundamentally, we uh, just help companies, uh, you, you know, run their, run their business efficiently. Um, so there's often a, a component of that. Uh, second, uh, M&A is uh, very frequently an opportunity. So it's a big part of the portfolio. But, uh, you know, especially with software businesses, you know, we recognize, um, you, you, you need to manage uh, the product and you need to manage go to market um, well um, to, 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 to realize the full potential of the business. Uh, when you look at go to market in particular, I mean, for a software company, um, you know, for a public software company, it's over 40% of revenue that's spent on marketing and sales and private companies, especially the ones that are VC backed, it's often much higher than 40%. So it's the most expensive thing on the income statement. Uh, and oh, by the way, it's also the determinant of growth. Uh, about how well you uh, kind of manage that. And so we just feel like there's a huge amount of opportunity for improvement. And especially when you think about go-to-market holistically, the marketing, the sales, customer success, post-serve support. And then also think about it holistically with the market and the product and competitive position. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work we do there. Fundamentally, what we want to do is we want to be um, uh, just very strong collaborative partners with the management teams in our companies. Um, to just help them be successful and take it to the next level. And uh, so we've, we've invested quite a bit of energy and um, uh, resources to develop that capability. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great segue to, into your role in particular because you're the Chief Growth Officer of Marlin. And I, when you look at your operations group, um, as, as a firm, Marlin has a lot more operating professionals than a lot of private equity firms out there. So talk a little bit about your mandate and how you go about fulfilling that. Yeah, you know, I think the mandate in many ways is simple. It's help our companies be successful in scaling to the next level. Um, you know, we, we very much, uh, you know, seek to, uh, you know, 
live by rule of X. So people say rule of 40, which is kind of like the EBITDA margin percentage plus the growth rate. So uh, what we want to do is just to help our companies, you know, grow, but grow efficiently. Um, and, you know, frankly, that's something quite different than, uh, uh, you know, what earlier stage companies uh, have been doing for the past several years. We know it's been a lot of growth at all costs, uh, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, most of our companies are a control investor. So, you know, if the company's losing money, that's, that, that's, that's an impact on us. Um, uh, so what we want to do just uh, fundamentally is help improve the companies. Um, so I think when we get involved with a company, there's a bunch of, you know, financial management stuff that we put down as foundational. But, so that's one aspect. Um, so, and then second, we want to provide distinctive resources from very experienced professionals uh, to support our portfolio companies. Um, so I think they kind of come in three flavors, if you will. Um, so one is, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, what's in some ways kind of the quote, traditional operating executive. So um, ex-CEO, um, you know, someone who's sort of been there, done that. And uh, often that, oftentimes that person will serve as kind of chairman of the board and be uh, an advisor to the CEO, as well as, of course, to the board um, and running the company. Um, there's a, a second uh, type of uh, resource. That's maybe the functional specialists. Um, so uh, I, I fall in that category, um, you know, go to market product, uh, you know, we even have some folks, uh, one, one indiv um, individual who is, a, um, you, know, uh, you know, just has a lot of expertise on real estate. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we've got resources to help with uh, kind of talent and finance. So that's the functional specialists who go in and work with companies. And I can I can double click on that in a moment. And then third, there's another uh, kind of operating director type of role, which is, in some ways is sort of the program leader role. Um, so when we uh, invest in a company, we'll work in tandem with the management team to create a value creation plan uh, and sort of, a, you know, just basically a multi-year plan to, you know, uh, ensure the businesses, uh, you know, hit the next level of sophistication and growth, uh, you know, sort of three to five years down the line. And so we have operating directors who um, basically uh, manage the full portfolio of value creation initiatives across the different functions. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, oftentimes those, the, those individuals are also playing a, a lot of the financial management role as well. Got it. And when you look at all those different areas, right, like I get the part about bringing an operating executive in, bringing functional resources. How closely tied do you get to the value creation or the investment thesis that went into the investment initially to figure out what to prioritize? And then how does that affect the resources that you're bringing in? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's uh, it's significant uh, is the short answer. Um, um, you know, first of all, we work very closely with our deal team. So, you know, uh, we've, uh, you know, deal teams are always, uh, you know, they've always been very strong investors with a lot of expertise in go-to-market. So, you know, they were doing this, you know, well before I joined, but, you know, I'd like to think that we've helped them take it to the next level. Um, and we've kind of aligned on a, a kind of a diagnostic approach for evaluating sort of strategy, operations, execution, talents in the companies. I would say most, uh, probably two thirds of the kind of the diligence process is run by the deal team. Uh, we tend to get involved towards the, you know, for lack of better words, the last third of the process, just when we want to go deeper, when we when we're kind of a shortlisted invent, uh, you know, potential investor, or we uh, we have exclusivity, um, and uh, that's then we'll dive in. Um, you know, we've seen so much, so I think there's a lot of pattern recognition. Um, you know, we we know what, what are the you know what are the, the kind of key uh, kind of drivers, uh, key things to look at in a business. Uh, we just seek to root cause performance and figure out where the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and then, you know, we've got uh, an understanding of what are the typical challenges in the company. And they're pretty straightforward, to be honest, in the good market side. It's like, you know, new logo growth, uh, customer expansion, uh, you know, pricing opportunities, um, you know, uh, scaling the sales team, scaling pipeline generation over time. Um, so, uh, and, and then, you know, of course, uh, kind of, uh, you know, getting a sense of, you know, does the management team have all the skills and capabilities needed to help the company succeed at the next level? So we look at all those things and then, you know, we can hypothesize a value creation plan very quickly uh, just because, you know, we've seen so much. Um, so that's what happens in diligence. So we're part of the, uh, you know, the diligence process and developing the investment thesis in almost all instances. Um, you know, sometimes processes happen really quickly. So there have been examples where it's been different, but that's 
unusual. Um, you know, we, we seek to work together as a, a really strong team. Um, and then once uh, we do make an investment, um, you know, we work with the management team to actually go deeper to understand the business uh, 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 at a more intensive level. Uh, you know, go deeper in the management team uh, to understand it. And, you know, that's our way of just, uh, you know, fully uh, getting a grasp of how we can be helpful. Um, and then we um, uh, will work uh, in partnership with our management teams to um, actually, uh, uh, you know, create a set of initiatives. There, there are often some foundational things that we want to put in place that we put in place in all our companies. Uh, and then we'll figure out what are the three to five kind of big needle movers um, and, you know, sometimes that's something management can do themselves. Uh, we provide guidance. Sometimes we get very hands-on to help them. Um, and then on other occasions, uh, you know, we'll pull in specialized third parties. Um, and uh, um, that's, uh, the, and we kind of put that into a kind of a formal value creation plan and, you know, seek to execute against that. And those three to five needle movers that you mentioned, in your experience, as you come into companies, uh, regardless of stage or, or vertical or, or industry that they're operating in or deal sizes that they're chasing, uh, what are the most common needle movers that you have found or that you as, as a group at Marlin end up focusing on? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll, I'll say the foundational things for sure, but then I'll, I'll highlight needle movers that we often get involved with. There's certain things that we want to make sure that are really in place well. Um, and I'd call these more in the foundational category. Um, so the first thing to me is segmentation and targeting. Um, most of our companies uh, don't have the scale of go-to-market resources to cover their full market opportunity. So we want to do a very intensive job of figuring out where's the, uh, what's the ideal customer profile, um, you know, where do they have right to win by looking at you know, revenue potential, but also propensity to buy and fit and momentum so we can focus the go-to-market resources on the sweet spot. So that's a foundational thing that oftentimes we, we have to dig in and or we'll, we'll work uh, to evolve what's, what's in place already. So that's, that's kind of number one. Uh, number two is just make sure the sales coverage model is right. Um, uh, you know, most of our companies are, you know, more right uh, than, um, uh, than, than not, uh, but oftentimes the, there, there can be a few things to fine tune. And then, you know, things like sales compensation and, um, you know, marketing and sales metrics. So those are things that we just want to upfront make sure um, are foundationally strong. Um, but those we would kind of say are in many ways kind of table stakes um, to running a, a business in a competitive market. Um, what we're really trying to do um, then is, uh, you, you know, if you think about the needle movers, um, there are a variety of things. Um, for a lot of our companies, um, uh, you know, the, the place that we would start, actually one other thing, and this can kind of be a needle, needle mover, positioning and messaging. Um, look, there's a sea of sameness in uh, software companies. I mean, we all see these crazy logo charts of like in this type of space, there's like these, you know, 50 logos and, you know, 5,000 MarTech companies. So uh, you've got to really have a distinctive story. Uh, and you really have to start with what's the problem that your customer is trying to solve? Why does it matter uh, to actually get attention? And, and how are you distinctive? So that's that's a key thing to, to, to nail. Um, another... Just to oh. jump in on that, I think that's yeah. a really good insight. It's, we, we find this too. We can come into companies that are 5, 10, and sometimes even 100 million in revenue, and they don't have segmentation fully built out or know their ICPs and who they're going after. And then their positioning and messaging is off to go after those targets, even if they know their TAM, SAM, or SOM. <laughs> um, and that kind of plays its way throughout the entire go-to-market strategy if that's not in place because it affects the website, it affects sales outreach, it affects overall marketing or go-to-market overall. So uh, totally, totally agree on that. That's a great insight. Yeah, I know. It's, it, it, you know, it's amazing to me how many people just say, hey, we're in this Gartner category and you know, we do X. It's like, well, first of all, it's not differentiated. And I think particularly in this environment where people are being more discerning about what investments they're going to make, I think it starts off with, what is the problem that you are solving for? How important is it? Why does it matter? Is it a mid-level buyer issue or is it an executive level business criticality issue? And if you're a, if you're a mid-level kind of, you know, the priority problem, you're, you're probably not going to get investment to actually move forward on that. So I think you have to start at that level. And then, so, it, you know, in some ways, I think a lot of it comes back to the, the, the things that, you know, I think Challenger codified pretty well that, uh, you know, teach, tailor, take control. 
Um, so you got to teach why does it matter? You got to tailor your solution to you know uh, their particular business, uh, and then yeah, you got to be kind of assertive. So I think Challenger continues to be incredibly, incredibly relevant. Um, uh, it's just sort of a foundational way, and you can you can, and that actually maybe leads to another thing that I think is a big needle mover is I think a lot of earlier stage companies are over dependent on a few reps. And if you really want to grow, you've got to have a, a you know a larger sales team. That means you've got to be able to hire, enable, and ramp up uh, reps um, uh, at, 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 at some volume, at some scale. So I think um, you know that process of kind of sales enable and sales enablement. And there's so many different components of it. You know, like sales methodology. People talk about that, but that's only one component. And even when you talk about sales methodology, a lot of people think about the deal management process and opportunity management, but there's actually opportunity management. There's account uh, planning, uh, there's territory planning, there's regional planning. So, and that's just the, the sales methodology part. Then you're gonna learn about the customer, the product, competitive, uh, how to get business done internally, um, you know, et cetera. So there's a huge amount to um, uh, kind of uh, sales productivity and kind of enabling the sales force to scale. I'd say that's the second one. Um, uh, a third one, uh, and if you don't have the positioning messaging, it's um, you, you, those reps in particular really struggle. Um, and so you've got to, whatever that story is, you've really got to make sure it runs all the way through, as you said, uh, you know, through all the aspects of, of what impacts the buyer's journey, which, you know, starts with a website and the content marketing, et cetera. Uh, but uh, certainly the reps have to be able to live it and, uh, you know, bring that story consistently. Um, the third thing I would say, and I know I, I, I know this is near and dear to your heart, it's pipeline generation. Like if you want to grow a company, you, you got to be able to continue to grow a pipeline. Uh, you know, when I, I was in a previous job at Ring Central, you know, we were doing pretty well. It's like we, we I, I joined at 350 million uh, ARR. You know, I think we got to like, you know, whatever, 500 million, um, uh, uh, whatever the number was within like a year. And, you know, we were excited. We were accelerating uh, revenue growth. We're growing at 30 plus per year. Um, but, uh, and we had hit our bookings target, which I think was, uh, you know, I think it was like $200 million, something like that. And uh, so I remember going to an offsite with the CFO and uh, the, the finance team. I kind of said, okay, great. We're doing great. 200 million bookings. Awesome. Well, guess what? This year, the uh, the number is like 250 to 275. And then a year after that, it's going to be, you know, low 300s and it's going to go to 400 million. And guess what? When we uh, when we get that, we're going to have to generate, you know, a billion and a half to $2 billion in pipeline. And this year we only generated 500. So we need to be ahead of that curve. It's not just hiring heads. Uh, like uh, it's a, it's about actually having programs and those programs will need to evolve. So demand generation uh, is a big challenge in many of the companies that we work with. And there are different components of it. There's demand generation that comes from inbound. So the uh, inbound, uh, the SEO kind of organic stuff, uh, then there's the, 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 the paid uh, and social, um, uh, but then there's outbound, especially if you want to go after medium size and large size companies, um, you know, you're doing much more ABM kind of programs and maybe you can leverage partners. And so that's an area that, um, you know, we often find um, our companies are good in certain areas, but they're underdeveloped in others. Um, so account based marketing and sales is a big area that, um, you know, we tend to focus on uh, for most of our companies because, you know, our segmentation and targeting will often say, well, your ideal customer profile, let's be just laser focused on identifying who those key accounts are. And they're not gonna come inbound. You're, you're gonna only get a handful of them. You've gotta be very proactive outbound and going after them. And it's it's actually, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty complex to execute. So you've gotta be really, really sharp. How you you have to be after. proactive about it. I, I think one of the things that you said, the underdeveloped aspect is we totally agree on that. We've seen it's very common that a company that's even doing a hundred million in revenue can have a sophisticated sales process or sales methodology, yeah. but very nascent on their marketing planning and strategy because they might be doing some product marketing work or sales enablement work or some events and trade shows. But when it comes to proactively planning, like let's say we need to close a hundred million in bookings or 50 million or whatever the number is, what is the amount of marketing support we need in order to be able to hit that number? And then how much budget do we need to deploy across different channels and programs in order to be able to get there? And we find that even sophisticated companies don't have that answer, either because the data is not in place 
or they haven't thought through all their programs and channels and campaigns to actually be able to work backwards and come back to a budget number that they can take to the board level. Yeah, no, we're, we're uh, that demand planning, we're, we're, we've become increasingly rigorous on it. Um, you know, we built out models uh, in partnership with our uh, portfolio, portfolio company uh, uh, marketing teams as well as sales teams to just say, okay, well, you do the exercise of working backwards from bookings in the future of what you want to hit and when you need to generate that pipe and uh, how it's going to, you know, convert over time. But then applying that, well, let's do that by segment. Let's do that by geo. Let's think about that by channel. Let's think about that by program. And then let's think about what needs to happen month by month in that lead the bookings model uh, against all those different slices uh, the, uh, and filters I just spoke about. And so that's something that we seek to put in place um, such that you actually have goals on a monthly basis for all of those different metrics uh, and you can uh, you know, assess your performance. And nobody's perfect on that stuff, but um, by being rigorous and thinking it through, um, you know, you, you've got a plan and like you know, in every company I've been a part of, uh, especially you know, Salesforce and Ring Central, uh, where I was previously, um, you, you know, what you evaluate is, um, uh, uh, well, at the quarter you evaluate, you know, how did it all go? But what we were, were doing was on a weekly basis, we're evaluating, hey, we expect to be at this point um, uh, from a pipeline standpoint by segment, by geo, by product line, et cetera, how are we doing? How are we tracking against that water line? And if we're off track, well, we want to be proactive um, to address it. So I think that kind of demand planning is a, a, the demand gen is really key. And then based on where they have sophistication or where they're lesser developed, that's where we'll, you know, support them. Um, oftentimes we'll pull in specialized partners for things like ABM, uh, just because it is a lot of, uh, you know, intensive, mm -hmm. um, you know, detailed orchestrated work. And I think there's just a big learning curve on it. So we, we want people to be successful up front and, you know, learn from experience. So um, that that's a big focus. Yeah, I, I think the point about being proactive is also an interesting one because ABM is in, important for a certain set of companies, right? So if your ACV yeah. is over 100,000 and you have maybe only 800 potential targets out there, ABM has to be a core part of your strategy because you're going after large accounts with large deal sizes with likely long sales cycles. And so you have to partner with sales to actively reach out to those folks. Conversely, if, you're, if your ACV is more transactional and you're selling five, 10, $15,000 deals, it can be not that profitable to focus on ABM. So that's the other right. aspect of thinking about the strategy of which channels are most relevant within your business model to be able to drive pipeline efficiently enough so that your CAC and payback periods are in check and your EBITDA margins are within range as well when you look at the overall marketing budget. Yeah, to totally agree. I mean, it starts with understanding where, 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 where do you play and what are the life cycle economics um, uh, of that. And, you know, sometimes it's, hey, we look at companies and they're doing too much in SMB and actually look at the life cycle economics on the cost to acquire, the cost to implement, um, and, uh, you know, what's the, you know, churn rate and um, just the economics don't really, um, um, line up. So then you have uh, then, then you have considerations. Well, let's evolve the pricing model, uh, or maybe let's shift a little bit more resources out market. So we're doing that with one of our companies right now, um, supporting the management team as they say, yep, we, we, we get it. We want to move more mid-market um, enterprise. Um, and then, you know, we, we do have uh, quite a number of companies that are actually very strong in SMB and it's, you know, more inbound driven, uh, but they still recognize, you know, but there are, uh, you know, like 500 to 1,000 accounts that are, uh, for which our value proposition is extremely uh, important. And so we are going to do some targeted um, uh, programs there. And as, as you all know, Shiv, I mean, ABM can be one to one, it can be one to many, it can be, you know, uh, you know one to uh, few. Yeah. Yeah. One to few, tailoring things to a specialized sub vertical. Um, and that can be just as effective. Um, uh, and you just have to vary the, the investment based on, you, you know, the, the life cycle economics as you just right. Totally yeah, I like, I like to think of it like a pyramid, right? So if you have your one to many, which is your smaller deal sizes, you need more standardized assets and content and, and resources to target those types of folks where maybe they're finding you on the website or you're having a webinar for a bunch of those types of accounts. Then you have your one to few, which are slightly larger, maybe more specific. You have segmentation around it, but maybe the accounts aren't large enough where you can go one to one and 
dedicate a ton of content resources where it's specifically tailored to that account. And then you have your one to few where every company, even if you're selling the SMB, you might have a list of Dream 1000 or Dream 100 accounts that require that customization because the deal sizes are large enough. And so coming back to your point on segmentation, that's really the starting point to really know yeah. what are the different accounts and how much revenue sits within each of those segments so that you can tailor your marketing strategy against those accounts on that pyramid. Yeah, and it's all totally knowable. Um, uh, you know, when I was in Salesforce, um, you know, I had a uh, kind of a role in sales strategy globally, um, or, or kind of led that team. And one of the big things that we wanted to do, this is way back a while now, uh, this is 2010, um, uh, you, you know, Mark really wanted to focus on, um, you know, winning in the enterprise. Uh, so Salesforce was growing, it was doing great. Uh, but, you know, Siebel still have most of the really large accounts. Uh, and there were examples of winning some really big ones. Um, but, you know, one of the big things that we uh, recognized that we needed to do and sort of Mark kind of got it is, hey, we got to win in the enterprise. And so we looked at, at the time, I think the enterprise definition was um, uh, an enterprise account has more than a thousand employees. Well, there's about 11, if we just take North America, I, I think there's about 12,000 companies that are greater than a thousand employees in North America. And that's what was an enterprise. And with those ratios um, uh, and the number of sales reps that we had, uh, each enterprise uh, sales rep um, had 50 accounts. Well, 50 accounts is a lot. Like, how do you focus on 50 accounts? So what we did was we did an intensive segmentation targeting exercise to say, all right, well, let's, well, let's focus on the high fit, high revenue potential. And that was going to be, you know, it was obvious that, okay, well, let's focus on more B2B centric companies for Salesforce at that time. So we pretty much just had sales cloud. Uh, and then let's focus on the ones that have, you know, more complex sales cycles. There are a bunch of key verticals that made sense. What happened over the course of two years is that, that uh, we hired a bunch more reps um, because we were having success and continuing to expand in the enterprise. But that average number of 50 accounts per AE, it went down to seven. Uh, and Quotas even went up, so you can guess this. The, we were very popular as we were kind of rolling this out, uh, but um, it was just focused. And what we showed people was, hey, look, if you actually apply, we had these scoring models, and this is what we apply in all our companies at Marlin. If you actually look at it to say we can perfectly predict, um, or almost perfectly predict, you know, where are you really going to get your bookings? And it's frankly, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, but it was just explaining that to everybody and say, we're going to focus you. And then we actually had, uh, you talked about the pyramid, even for the sales reps, we, we had three uh, different levels within enterprise. Um, we had the tippy top where you actually had on average 1.5 accounts per AE. So in fact, you actually even had some accounts, like I think Wells Fargo at the time made a lot of momentum. We saw a lot of opportunity in multiple buying units. I think we had multiple reps on uh, just a single account, Wells Fargo. So that was kind of like the tippy top, the strategics. The next level, uh, the reps had, I think, like seven. And then the, the bottom tier of enterprise, they had 15, one five. Um, so it's just about once you figure out where the revenue potential, propensity to buy and momentum is, you just focus your resources. So that applies uh, you, and the marketing budget parallels that as well uh, to say, hey, we're gonna put more energy on a quote dollars per account um, on the, on the uh, you know, the top tier versus the medium tier versus the lower tier. Right, I mean, yeah, those two functions being aligned on that is super important. Um, what made me think of something as you were talking through that is just how, how much of a focus given that m a is a part of your value creation philosophy how much effort is being put into the upsell cross-sell side and then also on, on pricing because that ends up be becoming a way to expand those accounts or, or generate more revenue from the accounts that we've already landed yeah no those are uh, really uh, significant value creation lovers um you, you, they're um, so we do do a lot of M&A and then cross sell is uh, something we put a lot of energy into. And I think we're getting more and more sophisticated at it. In fact, we just kind of wrote a playbook on uh, how to do cross sell and all the considerations. And just the reality is, uh, you, you know, what the data would suggest if you look at, you know, decades of M&A, um, you know, cross sell uh, uh, success far, far lags, um, you know, the goals that were set when the deal uh, was conceived. Um, and it's because there's a lot of things that you have to get right in driving cross-sell. 
And so we put a lot of energy in, you know, just like you have a targeting model for a new logo, you need to have a targeting model for cross-sell, for example, to say, well, who are the account? Well, and the benefit of cross-sell is, you know, a lot more about the target account because they're already a customer. So then you think about, well, what are all the attributes um, of uh, someone who would be a good fit for this? Uh, and then, you know, where are we housed? Um, uh, and then you have to think about, you know, what's the selling skill required and uh, are you selling to the same buyer? So there's a whole, there's a whole framework of all these different uh, elements that we look at to figure out, um, first of all, wh where to target, but then what's the right coverage model um, to go execute that? Um, because sometimes you just need like uh, the, the rep to focus on it. You just say, hey, I'm gonna give you some extra comp. Uh, but sometimes you need specialized resources. It could just be a BDR or maybe you need a sales engineer or sometimes it actually is just different enough, you know, very different uh, sales cycle, very different solution complexity, uh, different buyers. So even though you're selling to the same account, um, um, you know, it really could be extremely different. I mean, a good example of that that I think most people know is like, look at Oracle when they're selling, you know, what they call tech, which is like database and middleware versus apps, when, for example, you know, financials, uh, you know, uh, financial management software or HR software. They're just super different. So that's why um, those sales organizations are completely different. So you have to, um, so when they make those acquisitions, so you have to just think it through in a very, very structured way. Uh, and then what you also have to do is just measure it rigorously. So you should then be looking at, okay, we've done all this work to figure it out and we've educated the customer. And there's so many things and so many elements to get right. But then you have to measure it to say, okay, well, let me look rep by rep, like month by month. Are you um, uh, creating pipeline or are you having meetings? Are you creating pipeline? Are you progressing that pipeline? Are you winning deals? What's your win rate? And what you're invariably going to see is there are going to be certain reps who are much better at it than others. So, and that's natural. So it's not like, hey, I came up with this great enablement program and everyone's perfect. No, there's a huge learning curve. And so I think that's where, if you're really serious about cross-sell, you have to be intensive uh, about huddling uh, on a continuous basis and the right frequency is weekly to say, how's it going? What's working? What's not? Who's doing it? Who's not? And then, you know, let's problem solve and strengthen it. So I think the companies that are just really rigorous and structured uh, and committed to it um, are the ones that um, have more success. But there's a crazy amount of variance in cross sell effectiveness. So that's a big there's some phenomenal insight there. I think your point about the industry data that says cross sells are often overestimated. I think that's a really great point because I think often when we're modeling, you look at a bolt on or an add on and you're like, obviously our current customer set will be a good fit for this other product that we're buying, but that doesn't always work out because maybe needs are different or the products are different or, or the sales cycles are different. And I think the other point that you said that's I think worth um, highlighting is this internal segmentation work because we talk a lot about the external, how big is our TAM and segmenting that, but within the existing customer base, who are the, who are the customers that would be ideal fits for the cross sell and upsell so that we truly understand the, the white space revenue potential there, because I think that's often overestimated as well. Um, and then the other piece that jumped out is that I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the product side and the packaging side to actually make it worthwhile to even, even if you have a good fit customer, sure. you kind of have to approach yeah. them in the right way with the right kind of offer. Right kind of offer. And then also you have to, of course, there's a whole product element to this too of like, uh, you know, is it, um, you know, is the product really well integrated? Um, and, uh, and is it a good, uh, you know, customer user experience? I mean, I think, there, uh, I, I won't pick on companies, but you know, I see a lot of go to market software uh, companies. Uh, and you know, like there's this one company in the sales enablement space that's made this really smart acquisition um, of a complementary capability. But then when you get to the product, yes, okay, great, it's one login, but then it takes you to a separate page. Uh, so like having two apps and two tabs, and it's just not fully done. And look, you, you, there, there are short term and medium term and long term implications of, of product. You don't get product integration overnight, but obviously that's a that's a huge component as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's great. Um, and then last thing worth touching on is just pricing. So tell yeah. us about like how much work are you doing into that, and what type of analysis is going into creating value on the pricing side? Yeah, so pricing is a huge lever, and I, I think most. Uh, 
um, you know, private equity companies get that as well. So we've been um, we've, we've been quite um, uh, structured in terms of uh, kind of going after it. Um, what we have done in particular is. Uh, um, we, we actually, well, first of all, I, I, our companies get it. And so they've, they've been pretty proactive on it. And there's, uh, there's a variety of different opportunities. Uh, I, I think the issue is, well, first of all, I, why is it uh, such a compelling lever? It's because if you, uh, you know, make a change in price, aka raise price um, by 1%, it basically flows to the bottom line. So in a 10% EBITDA company, raise price by 1%, you can have, uh, you know, pretty close to 11% EBITDA. Uh, so that 1% drives the 10% EBITDA increase. So that's pretty cool. I, I think most people kind of like that. Um, but uh, but companies are also just, you know, want to be very mindful to, um, you know, raise prices in a, a smart way. Um, uh, and uh, they're not often that experienced in how to do it. So we, we see the, the typical bias is um, companies are more timid uh, about changing pricing or raising pricing. And that really limits um, their long-term growth potential. Um, and we feel like that's a huge opportunity for us um, to, to help them. Um, and so we actually have done a, you know, we, we did a big pricing assessment across all our 50 portfolio companies uh, last year and found a bunch that uh, we could help further. They were already doing quite a bit because this has been a focus for us, but it starts off with pricing strategy. So you want to align the pricing model with how the customer gets value. Uh, and then you want to be mindful of, um, you know, you, you might tier that based on different customer segments um, um, or different, uh, you know, product capabilities. So without going super deep there, you start with pricing strategy um, to get a sense of what makes sense. And then next, you go into a pricing model design so you know what what is the metric that's actually going to determine pricing is it is is it a seat is it usage of some sort um you know there um you know there's all kinds of different metrics that you can apply and then you know how do you structure them how does it scale um uh, with um you know greater uh, for lack of a better word usage by the company and how do you measure that um and then third is price setting so uh thinking through what's the value to the customer um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, uh, match versus competitors, uh, and your offerings aren't going to be identical. So you need to calibrate for, you know, some competitors might have a more complete offering. Some might have an error offering. So, um, it's, it's sort of, uh, how do you communicate your price differentiation? Um, and then when you're doing these things, uh, these are big decisions. So there's a lot of testing that you can do. Uh, and then once you, uh, to, to make sure you get it right, if you're making changes, and then once you run all this through, you're like execution of the pricing program is huge. So um, how do you communicate the business value? Um, you, you know, the best way to communicate price, like I, I was in management consulting. Um, uh, so uh, at a particular firm, I had a client, um, when they found out what our prices were, they were just mortified. I was with, with one of the top strategy firms. They were just absolutely mortified. It's like, I can't believe that's what you charge per month. Uh, and they're like, how on earth could you uh, justify that? And what we showed is, hey, well, we'll do some diagnostic work and we feel like we can get a 10x EBITDA uh, versus our fees um, uh, because we see all these different opportunities that we've seen before. So suddenly it's like, oh, wait, so I charge, you charge me a dollar and I get $10. Um, and because we could help them save tens of millions of dollars, we charged them many millions of dollars um, and it was a win-win. Um, so how do you do that? And then of course you got to flow that all the way through contract terms, et cetera. And then there's a lot of pricing governance work uh, to make sure that you're actually, um, you know, being mindful of where you do discounting and how, you know, how deals are reviewed, especially when the big ones, um, what kind of terms, how do you get feedback from the market about when price is working versus not working? So there's a lot to pricing um, and it, just being, you know, uh, holistic and sort of thinking through pricing strategy is really important. So that's something that we focus on. Uh, and oftentimes we'll pull in a partner to do it because there are specialty pricing firms out there. Um, we, we have the capability to do it uh, and we'll play a role in overseeing the work. Uh, but we find it helpful to, um, you know, pull in an, uh, an expert. Because there's a lot of specialized analysis and customer interviews that you got to do too. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you touched on a bunch of great points there. I, I think in general, a lot of solutions are are underpriced for the value they bring. You you mentioned this idea of value based pricing, which is a consulting model. Like 
thinking about the value mm-hmm. they bring. That's kind of how we think about our consulting fees as well. And with, for, for us, if we can drive 30% more pipeline on a recurring basis, like what's that worth to a company? It's worth millions of dollars. So we kind of price accordingly, right? And so sure. for, for software businesses, I think it's it's different. But at the same time, a lot of them are underpriced and founders in general are kind of hesitant to to charge more. They feel like this this fear that the market will just reject their offer. And so a lot of the modeling and some of the the scientific approaches to pricing, like the, the Van Westendorp model and things like that, that you kind of have to look at to find those optimal price points. I think there's a ton of work that needs to go into there. And um, I think one thing worth touching on would be the modeling around as you increase prices, you experience an increase in expansion revenue, but then you kind of also have to model against the expected increase in churn and your net retention metrics, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I I think as you highlighted, there's a bunch of specialized uh, analytical techniques to to go do this. Uh, But yeah, you want you want a model that you could at a simple level, you could say it's scenario planning to say, hey, if I, um, you know, raise price by and, you know, price increasing is, uh, uh, you know, a meaningful uh, strategy um, um, and you can do it because you you are providing value and you have that opportunity, um, you need to uh, 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 simultaneously uh, be thinking about, you know, what is the, the churn impact? And you don't just do it in aggregate. I think one of the big mistakes or misnomers people have is like, oh, uh, like when prices were going up, inflation was shooting up, like, uh, you know, there's uh, some people would just say, hey, let's just raise everybody's price 10%. Well, mm-hmm. that's actually a really, uh, it's overly simplistic and fundamentally flawed strategy. Um, there's certain people are getting a ton of value where you're highly, uh, um, you know, embedded in their workflow. You've got multiple champions. Uh, you've been there for uh, a long period of time. Um, you know, you actually have much more pricing power than temper, and you haven't raised price in a while. Um, uh, you have much more pricing power than that. You might be able to do twenty percent, thirty percent, and you may not do it all at once. You might phase it over time, uh, and then you have, might have others who are you know more cost sensitive, or they've had some you know. Uh, uh, you know, delivery issues, or there's been a change uh, in kind of your, you, you've lost your key sponsor, um, and, or, you know, so there are just other factors to think about uh, to <clears throat> segment it, and you might want to be more conservative uh, in uh, the price increase for them. So that, you know, that just raise everybody by X percent, we, we think that uh, is generally a very flawed strategy that will underperform. But you got to model it out to say, well, what are the relevant seg- What are the attributes to think about? Let's divide those into segments, and then let's have a scenario plan that says, all right, if we make this percentage change in price, what do we think the the potential um, you know uh, churn rate is going to be, and how will it change? And let's compare those dollars um, uh, to say, well, how much money are we getting on the price increase? Uh, versus the dollars that we're losing on churn. And you just have to run that analysis there. Yeah, and, and test and, and constantly measure. So, um, so I know that is, a, is a big opportunity, uh, especially more PLG, B2C, SMB ish kind of businesses yeah. too. Yeah, and especially with that EBITDA impact, it's usually one of the top three revenue drivers or in the, in, in the investment thesis. So, uh, thank okay. you for the insight on that. Um, um, I know we're coming up on time, so I, I just want to just summarize all the things that we kind of talked about. We talked about segmentation, the sales coverage model, positioning and messaging, the go-to-market and and the pipeline generation side of it, the demand gen, cross-sell, upsell, and obviously pricing. And I think this was a phenomenal conversation. So thank you for your insights on that. Um, for, for the audience, if they want to learn more about Marlin or, or the work that you're doing, where can they go to get more information? Um, you know, MarlinEquity.com is a, is a good place to go. Um, uh, that, that gives a, a little bit of a sense of us and, uh, you know, lot, lots of good professionals uh, uh, to, to contact at our firm. What we really seek to do is, you know, we actually follow companies for uh, companies that we like for, for years and build relationships with the management teams um, and just, you know, talk about how we can help them. And fundamentally, we see ourselves as business partners uh, for, uh, for growing companies. And, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, we're, I, I work with a, a really wonderful set of colleagues. So uh, I'd invite you to, um, you know, please get to know us. And um, uh, no, it's been a pleasure. Chip. And I think we, we touched on a lot of great stuff. We, we have 40 value creation levers for go-to-market. Um, I think we hit on the, uh, the, 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 the top ones. So I, I think uh, 
Um, you, you and I are aligned on that, but there, there's other stuff too. There, there's, there's tons of other stuff. We could do like a four hour session on that. So. <laughs> uh, but we'll be sure to put up links to Marlin Equity on, on the podcast notes. So uh, thanks for that. And we'll share the any other resources that you want to include for the audience so that they can follow up and, and get in touch as well. But overall, AJ, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you being on. Yeah, my pleasure, Shiv. Uh, wish you a great weekend. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you take off, just a few requests from our side. Number one, if you enjoyed today's content and want more of it, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Number two, if you are in the market for marketing strategy consulting services, due diligence services, or fractional CMO services, please visit our website at www.howtosass.com and schedule a consult today. And number three, if you haven't already, grab a copy of my book, Post Acquisition Marketing. It's available on Apple Books, on Amazon, and any bookstore that you can find online. Get a copy because it walks through the framework that we take all of our clients through and it'll definitely add value to your business. And that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time.